So now I have the further great honor of getting to introduce our guest speaker this evening, a Columbia trained physician and longtime professor at the University of California at San Francisco, Dr. Harold Varmus, is one of the most brilliantly creative minds in biomedicine, science education, and research policy in the world today. In the 1990s, Dr. Varmus served for six years as director of the National Institutes of Health where he is credited with almost doubling federal investments in biomedical research. From January 2000 until last July, he served as president and CEO of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. In addition, he co-chaired PCAST, President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Last May, the president nominated Dr. Varmus as director of the National Cancer Institute, a post he's held since July. And Harold, we simply cannot thank you enough for stepping back into the role of national service at a critical time when, as a nation, we have to find the right balance between the pressing need to reduce the deficit and, at the same time, to preserve investments that will promote economic growth. Among countless honors awarded for his research, two stand out. In 1989, Dr. Varmus with Michael Bishop was awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering the cellular origin of retroviral genes that cause cancer. And in 2001, Dr. Varmus won the highest distinction reserved for an American scientist, the National Medal of Science. He's authored more than 300 scientific papers and five books, including a memoir, The Art and Politics of Science. And to these career highlights, let me just add, that Harold Varmus ranks as one of the nation's most outspoken, articulate, inspired, relentless, and influential advocates for the value of basic and applied scientific research. He is, in a very real sense, a friend of humanity and a great friend of MIT. And we're honored to have him tonight as our speaker. Harold. Well, Susan, thank you. You make it a hard introduction to live up to, but uh, I'll give it a try. First, let me thank Tyler and David and Susan for allowing me to come up here. It's, Washington's a good town to be out of these days. Uh, we're a place where budgets are tough and uh, there's an effort underway to dismantle a lot that we built, so it's good to come to a place where something magnificent is being built and faith in the future of science and technology are, are palpable. It's a pleasure for me to be here for other reasons as well. First, as the NCI director, I'm extremely proud of our 66 NIH desi NCI designated cancer centers. Uh, this has been for nearly 40 years, uh, one of the great ones, and uh, with strong leadership and amazing contributions to our understanding of cancer. Secondly, I've had a long-term personal association with MIT and its cancer center. I'm old enough to remember trips to MIT when there was no cancer center. I watched it develop. I knew its first director. More about that in a moment. I have a long association with the current director, and I hope I don't embarrass him by saying that uh, that, is, that association extends back to days when he was, believe it or not, a graduate student in my lab. I'm very proud of that association. Uh, and uh, his promise and, and uh, insights were palpable even at that time. I've also known many members of the faculty here, uh, and I've known uh, some of the benefactors of the new building, most obviously the most prominent benefactor, David Koch himself, who was a member of our board at Memorial Sloan Kettering and served until recently on the National Cancer Advisory Board, the, the major advisory committee to the NCI itself. I've also had associations with the Whitehead Institute, where I served in, on sabbatical in I hate to say it, 22 years ago. Um, that was the sabbatical in which I enjoyed the company of my two mentors, Bob Weinberg and David Baltimore, and also the company of Tyler Jacks, who had recently left my lab and commented acerbically when I arrived on sabbatical that it's like going off to college and finding that your father had taken the dorm room next door. <laughs> I've also been an advisor at the Broad Institute and uh, a close colleague of Eric Lander. So my, my situation here is a very comfortable one, and I'm very pleased to be able to, adjo to gather with you on this occasion. 
Now, in thinking about what I was going to say, I decided to, deep, to dig a little deeper into the history of the Cancer Center at MIT and to talk a bit about the early days of the Center for Cancer Research. And I found when I did that, that uh, there are two very important analogies to think about in relation to um, the current events. Namely, what it's like to build a new facility in which cancer research is going to be conducted. And secondly, to think about how you gather the talent that's going to pursue cancer at different times in our history. Before I do that, let me just give you a brief synopsis of the life of Salvador Luria, who was the first director of the MIT Center for Cancer Research. Salvo, whom I knew moderately well, was born in Italy in 1912, received an MD working, um, uh, an MD in, in, in Turin, studied physics briefly in Rome when he found that he was not suited to take care of patients, um, was planning to go off to the States on an Italian fellowship when the very day after his fellowship was awarded, an edict was issued in 1938 against Jews accepting Italian fellowships, uh, and that prevented him from going to the US to study. He then escaped the Nazis by going to Paris to work. Then when the Germans were approaching Paris in 1940, he fled Paris, I am proud to say, by bicycle. Those of you who know my pet passion in life know this is meaningful to me. Uh, then went on to Lisbon in the U.S., came here, founded what's known as the Phage Group with, with uh, Al Hershey and, and Max Del Brook. Uh, and after a very rich history of research with these individuals and others, uh, he was actually the first, he was the, his first graduate student with Jim, was Jim Watson at the University of Indiana. Uh, the three founders of the Phage Group received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1969. Um, he was also active as a writer and teacher, a very cultured man with wide interests in the arts, humanities, and politics. The very year he received the Nobel Prize, it was revealed in the New York Times that he had been blacklisted by the Department of Health and Human Health, Education and Welfare uh, and forbidden from serving in, uh, on the government advisory panels. And that was one of the first events that drew attention to the dangers of mixing of science and politics in our government. Now, the cancer, Center for Cancer Research was an idea promoted initially by the leadership at MIT in 1972. Uh, and um, Salvo was chosen for this, not because of his experience in cancer research per se, uh, but because of his prestige as a, a scientist and his remarkable insight. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about um, his own thinking about this uh, and uh, the way in which he went about setting up the Cancer Center. I think it's instructive uh, with respect to the current situation here. Uh, and I'm grateful to Salvo for writing two books, one of which is a memoir from which uh, some of the recollections have been, have been obtained. And uh, he also deposited his papers both at the National Library of Medicine uh, and um, at the uh, uh, so at the American, American Philosophical Association, uh, Salvo incidentally uh, died in 1991. So uh, I'm going to focus my remarks on two issues very briefly. Uh, one, I know you're all hungry, uh, but dinner won't be served until uh, I'm done, so I'm conscious of the pressures on me. But I want to spend a few minutes talking about uh, uh, these two issues. First, the experience of being a Cancer Center director and the, the pride in new property and how that property comes to be uh, developed. And then secondly, about uh, the assembly of individuals that make a cancer center appropriate for the time. So in his memoir, he wrote that in 1972, I was asked to organize and direct a, cancer, a center for cancer research. I accepted a decision that may have been unwise, but at least ensured me against idleness. With David Baltimore and Phil Robbins, I had the first nucleus of a cancer center. I needed money, a building, and more colleagues. So parenthetically, at that point, he, he um, found Herman Eisen to make up uh, what he called his three musketeers, Robbins, Baltimore, and Eisen, uh, and then later recruited Bob Weinberg and Nancy Hopkins and Phil Sharp and many others you've heard mentioned uh, a moment ago. So to get back to his narrative. So, 
The NCI plus private foundations provided the money. The building was a coup. MIT owned on campus a building leased to the Brigham Chocolate Factory, such a venerable Boston manufacturer that Sunday sale of Brigham's candies was supposedly exempted from the Massachusetts Blue Laws. Inside the building, half-naked men with long poles stirred chocolate in large cauldrons, a scene recalling Blake's illustrations from Dante's Inferno. <laughs> One glance at the plans of the building showed me that it was what I wanted. Enormously strong columns, 20 feet apart, lots of windows, and a desirable vicinity to the biology department. And the New York Times sidewa side sidewalk box was right outside the door. The Brigham Ch Chocolate Factory moved out, and in the fall of 1993, just a year afterwards, we moved in. So once they moved in, as director, he, he wrote, I learned the joys and frustrations of administration. The hardest part is having to say no to perfectly reasonable requests from colleagues when funds are either not available or in limited supply. I find decision making easy, but often have a hard time afterwards wondering whether the decisions were right or wrong. I don't know how you feel about this, Tyler, but uh, I'm sure you make all the right decisions. I do not remember enjoying any single task in my life, he wrote, more than designing and supervising the remodeling of that building. I became expert in the two major functions of a laboratory director, a knowledge of plumbing and the art of coaxing physical plant people to do in a week what might usually take two months. And clearly, Tyler has learned that art and brought things in under budget and ahead of time. Even the MIT gardeners love me. I don't know if they love you yet, Tyler, but they will. I filled our doorway with colorful impatience. Now, I know from being taken around this building before it was finished by Tyler and his hard hat that he loved doing this, too. Um, you'll note that it was quick to turn a chocolate factory into a, into a laboratory for a very small number of people. Um, this was clearly a building that uh, included compromises with reality, uh, as opposed to what we've been able to do here, starting with a long planning process that included a lot of folks uh, that uh, was built to a specified plan that, uh, that developed a building that anybody who's toured the building as I did today and previously before it was finished uh, represents uh, uh, the culmination of this new wonderful architecture of science laboratories with plenty of views and lights, a place where people can spend 16 hours a day uh, engaged in work they're passionate about with the kind of organization that promotes the kinds of interactions that make uh, modern science work optimally. Now, the second thing I'd like to talk briefly about is how a center becomes more than the sum of its parts. I've mentioned that Salvo began his work as a, as a physically trained, as a geneticist who was interested in bacterial viruses and, and, and uh, damage to DNA. Uh, not the most obvious person, you might think, to put in charge of a cancer center. He was not known as a cancer biologist. But Salvo understood, first of all, from a, from a very broad perspective, what it meant to do cancer research at the beginning of the 1970s, and he understood the importance of blending uh, people with different perspectives to pursue a problem as complex as cancer. Recall that uh, 1990, 1972 was the year after uh, the, the Congress passed the national, the, the uh, the National Cancer Act, and uh, it was a time when people were being promised that cancer would be eliminated in about a quarter of a century, a totally unrealistic aspiration at that time. But Salvo understood that this was not a problem of simple, um, of simple engineering in 1972. And he wrote in, his, uh, in a lecture that he gave a few years later to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences that sending a man to the moon involved nothing but Newtonian mechanics plus a lot of sophisticated gadgetry. And clearly, um, the, 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 the war on cancer was initiated two years after John Kennedy's uh, inspired um, message that we would send a man to the moon in, in a decade had been absorbed by the American public as the way science might get done. What Salvo then wrote 
was that to control cancer, we must first understand what cancer is, how cancer cells behave, and how they differ from normal cells, and how normal cells are put together. The Newton of cancer, he wrote, has not yet appeared on the scene, or maybe is just now getting his or her graduate degree. Now, as you've heard from Tyler, a lot of progress has been made in attempts to answer these questions. Still far from done, but ready to strike out in some new directions. Now, when Salvo took over the Center for Cancer Research, uh, there was a new focus on viruses that were known to cause cancer and on the importance of genetics in cancer research. And he was able to see the connection between his own scientific history and what the cancer research community was now facing. And he wrote in the same lecture to the American Academy, in 1946, he said, I was interested in the effects of radiation on genetic material. And I asked myself the question of whether a virus, a bacterial virus, had just one gene or many. In the latter case, could two viruses be damaged by radiation in different genes in such a way that they might come together to reconstruct a good virus? Now, that curiosity about a problem that's a little difficult to understand over dinner um, led to the discovery, he wrote, that the genetic material, the DNA of bacteria and viruses, could repair radiation-induced damage. Later, it was found, now making a connection between his own work and cancer research, that genes in all organisms are subject to damage and repair. It took 20 years, he wrote, before somebody found that the human disease, xeroderma pigmentosum, which leads to skin cancer, is a genetic defect caused by an inability to repair DNA injured by radiation. And only recently is it becoming clear that the DNA repair system present in every cell makes errors, which are mutations, and are likely to be the cause of many cancers, including those produced by chemical carcinogens. So what Salvo was able to see in the early 70s was that an understanding of fundamental uh, mechanisms of genetic damage, genetic repair, um, and understand the function of genes was going to be important in cancer research. And we now know that to be a fundamental property of the way we approach cancer. But the new manifestation of the MIT Center for Cancer Research, the Koch Institute, features another novel fusion, the fusion of cancer biology and cancer genetics with bioengineering, uh, and uh, in, in, an effort intended to expand the perspective of, uh, of medically oriented cell and molecular biologists with the expertise of engineers, often working at nanoscale, to think about a wide range of problems, from delivery of molecules uh, to, to cancer cells, uh, to the operation of cancer cells as biological systems, bringing quantitation, physical principles, chemical principles to bear on a problem that's fundamental to how cells work. This is, in my view, an extension of the Laureate tradition, housed in a building that's appropriate for the times, um, and given the rich history of success of cancer research on the MIT campus, all of us who are responsible for funding research on cancer in the country are truly and deeply excited about what's happening here. So I want to congratulate you, Tyler, David Koch, all of you who support this center, and wish you the very best in the future. Thank you.